Thank you. And thanks again for uh, joining us for this discussion of, of uh, immigration policy in Australia and what the UK should, should be learning. Now, as many of you will know, I think um, we immigration people in the UK just really love Australia. Um, as of uh, January this year, we now have um, what we're told is an Australian style points based system. And that, um, in fact, we love Australia so much that that replaced a previous system that was introduced in 2008 and at the time was also hailed as an Australian style uh, points based system. Not to be confused with the Australian style points based system that was introduced in 2002 called the Highly Skilled Migrant Program. Um, so we, um, we like Australia in the UK. Uh, one thing we don't actually do that much here is uh, talk about what Australia actually does with its um, work related immigration policy. You know, how does this policy work and, and is it effective? And so I'm really pleased to have um, Henry Sherrill from the Grattan Institute, which is an Australian public policy think tank. Um, and Henry is, I think, one of the most incisive analysts that I've come across of Australian um, immigration policy. He's held various positions inside and outside of, of government. And he's recently written um, actually a really excellent report evaluating work visa policy in, um, in Australia. And the findings of that, I think, are really relevant across, um, across a lot of countries, including the UK. So what we're going to do is I'm going to hand over to, to Henry to say a little bit about um, what he found in the recent um, report. And I'll, I'll also, Henry, be curious to hear your thoughts on um, some of these sort of key questions that we've been grappling with here in the UK. So, you know, how, how well is the famous Australian points based system doing at, at selecting skilled migrants? Do you think it's been an effective way of managing um, criteria? Um, and then I think another thing that I suspect a lot of people on the call will be interested in is um, uh, what Australia does about people um, who uh, aren't, who in jobs that are not classified as, um, as high skilled and may not be eligible for the points based um, system. There's been a big debate um, in the UK uh, over the last few months about shortages of uh, certain categories of workers after the free movement from the European Union came to an end. Um, particularly in industries like hospitality, and then um, the, the latest one has been about truck drivers. So I'm interested, you know, how Australia deals with concerns about shortages, does it give special treatment to some occupations, and what are the effects of, of policy in that area? Um, so Henry, um, over to you. Great. Well, thanks, uh, Madeline, and thanks uh, to Compass uh, for hosting. Uh, this call as well. Um, before we start, I'd just like to, uh, in Australia, um, it's a common practice to pay our respects to uh, traditional owners of the land in Australia, uh, where, where we're based. And so I'm in the ACT in Canberra, uh, and the traditional owners of the land here are the Ngunnawal people. And so uh, I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, and to recognise that when we talk about immigration policy, particularly in Australia, um, we're all immigrants, uh, except for those who were here first uh, 60,000 years ago. Um, so thanks for, for the introduction, um, Madeline. That was uh, kind and, and yeah, and thanks for the opportunity to, to talk about our report and also some of the questions uh, which fall out of it. Um, our report was the first for the think tank I work at, the Grattan Institute on Australian Immigration Policy. And what we wanted to do was examine Australia's skilled permanent visa framework and ask, you know, how well is it performing uh, and under what criteria is it performing? Um, we've had uh, really big shifts in Australian immigration policy over a sort of three decade period where we had a heavily family based system. Uh, which shifted and transformed uh, from the mid 90s uh, to a skilled based system uh, and also a system which integrated uh, temporary visas uh, in a very heavy way as well. And so we're at this point now where we sort of have the borders closed. We still have our borders closed. Uh, they don't look like they're going to be opening until uh, at least until into next year. And we think it's a really good time for Australian policymakers to grapple with some of these questions. Uh, and to think about what we want to do with Australia's immigration policy going into the future. So um, we, we, we kind of started by saying, well, who do we make immigration policy for? And why do we do that? And I think sometimes that question gets missed a little bit. Um, we are a think tank, which is sort of domestic 
uh, economic and social policy. And uh, I guess our worldview is that we should be making public policy for the people of Australia. Uh, and that in immigration, you sort of lead you to some very tricky choices uh, almost straight away. Uh, we decided that we should try and, and, and clarify what immigration, the effects are for the incumbents of Australia, as opposed to the effects of the migrants themselves. And you know, as I'm sure almost all people on this call would be aware, you know, immigration is probably one of the best poverty alleviating mechanisms that high income countries have in their in their arsenal of development. Um, but at the same time, that's often not a core argument uh, put in national policy debates. Uh, and so we tried to examine Australia's skilled framework, a uh, skilled work framework under these criteria. Uh, and it, it led us to, to sort of three main findings. Uh, Australia runs a, a relatively large business investment program to try and sort of lure high wealth individuals and innovative firm owners uh, to Australia under the banner of our skilled migration program. Uh, we run a program size permanent visas of about 11,000 to 13,000 a year, which is about... Uh, 15 to 20% of all visas uh, for, for at the moment for any given year. And what we found is, is these visas simply don't stack up. Um, investment visas, uh, and there's a number of different visas in this category, have genuinely poor results when we look at how much income these people are earning across all of the different ways people can earn income. Uh, when we compare them to both skilled workers, skilled sort of people in employment, and also uh, Australian incumbents in the workforce. Uh, and Australia has sort of doubled down on this approach in a recent policy decisions have increased the size of this program. Uh, and we think that that's going in the wrong direction. And uh, my personal opinion, having looked at this across a number of different countries now is that these visas are incredibly difficult to get right. Uh, they're sort of very appealing, I think, to policymakers because uh, they sound good. Uh, innovation and investment, it's hard to argue against that uh, for your talking points, but when you actually look at them, they, they, they sort of crumble apart very easily. Uh, it's hard to select people who are entrepreneurial and innovative on those specific characteristics. Uh, and that's what we found with our report. Um, and so we recommended the abolition of these visas under Australia's skilled migration framework. Um, but I think sort of more pertinently uh, to, to many other high income countries is sort of what Australia does with skilled work visas specifically. So Madeline talked about the points test, um, but we also have this sort of uh, well-established system of employer sponsorship as well. So, um, I'll, I, Melon, maybe we could start with one of the questions, and, and where I can just sort of weave in some of the bits of the report uh, which we talked to. Um, but I might start with the first question. I think it's on, on sort of low-skilled work and, and sort of how does Australia grapple with this issue of low-skilled work? And with our work visas, uh, we kind of don't. We, we don't really have work visas in a, in a broad sense for entry level, uh, below, below average median wage jobs. Um, we have a, a handful of visa, small visa programs for Pacific citizens uh, in, in regional communities. And we have just had announced a new agricultural work visa. So these, these things are emerging, um, but by and large work visas um, are pegged to skilled occupation lists, and you can only get a work visa, uh, either temporary or permanent, uh, if you have an occupation which is skilled. And we use skilled uh, via education proxies. So we use qualifications, and we uh, have a heavily qualification based framework. So if you, you know, skilled means having a bachelor degree or having a, an advanced vocational education. Uh, and our statistical agency uh, has gone through and created the classification uh, for of the labour market and, and allocated every single occupation in, in the labour market, uh, a skill rating of one to five. And if you the occupation is not classified as skilled, it's very, very difficult to get a work visa. Now, there are some ad hoc marginal exemptions to that, but by and large, it is very hard 
to get a work visa uh, for, say, a truck driver, uh, which I've been reading about in the Financial Times uh, endlessly, it seems, for the UK. Uh, so uh, that just that that set of policy decisions in Australia, uh, we don't really engage with that. But it's it's kind of a sleight of hand because we do have immigrants in Australia doing entry level work uh, and for sort of minimum wage jobs as well. And this occurs by a sort of an emerging growing population of people on temporary visas, but temporary visas, which are not, the, the premise of them is not work. So we're talking about international students and we're talking about uh, backpackers. Uh, and there's a, we are very good at sort of crafting other numerous bits of this as well. We have a, a growing population of about 110,000 temporary graduates who were international students and now they are, they've got some form of work visa because they studied in Australia. Um, and, you know, on face value, it sort of seems like these shouldn't be very big categories, but they are growing categories in Australia. They're not the largest populations, but they represent uh, the total number of temporary people on a temporary visa in the Australian labour market is about seven to eight percent. And uh, studies suggest and census data suggests that about 60 percent of those uh, are working in what we would call unskilled or semi-skilled roles or entry level jobs where wages are, are, are not uh, sort of, you know, uh, commensurate with what we would call skilled work. So we do have migrants doing low wage work in Australia, but we don't have them come in for the purpose of doing that work. Uh, and so I think Australia has tried to have the best of both worlds uh, from a uh, sort of re rhetorical perspective. We say we run a skilled migration program, which we do, uh, and we have a, 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 a system uh, of work permits, uh, which are based towards jobs which require uh, educational qualifications, uh, but then we also have, uh, yeah, especially concentrated in certain parts of the labour market, uh, it would be the same in, in most high income countries, horticulture, hospitality, retail, construction, uh, transport, delivery, uh, these types of occupations uh, where we see growing uh, populations of people on temporary visas so which we, we we have we have the rhetoric of a skilled migration program which does stack up and our report found that on average uh, a skilled worker who is employed by their employer who is sponsored by their employer uh, earns uh, significantly more than for the same age uh, as an Australian incumbent so those skilled work programs are, are pretty good at, at picking up uh, skilled workers and facilitating them into uh, jobs which pay well. Um, but we also have on the other side uh, this, this growing number of temporary workers. And I think um, one thing which is, it, it, one thing which I think about a lot, I guess, in terms of immigration policy is it's hard to imagine a lot of these essential jobs disappearing. If you think about supply chains and care facilities and restaurant kitchens and delivery drivers, like if you use the, the jargon that they're non-tradable, you can't do them remotely, um, but they're also low wage. Uh, and when we classify them by education proxy, we think of them as unskilled. Um, so we have people doing these jobs, uh, which are not highly paid and they're not being sponsored and they're not eligible for permanent residency in most instances, but this job isn't going to disappear. This job is gonna be here for, for, for some time. Uh, I, I don't think we're gonna automate our way out of, out of uh, delivery drivers in the next 15 to 20 years, although maybe, maybe we will, um, but it's, it seems that we have this disjuncture where there are certain types of jobs where clearly there is demand in the labour market uh, for uh, some of these jobs to be filled by migrants, uh, yet they are they're sort of ineligible for our formal work 
visa classifications. And I think the, you know, the, the upsides of this system are the government doesn't have to provide permanent visas in a very, you know, in a very like mercantile perspective. Like we, we can sort of, Australia can essentially churn through people on temporary visas. A student might come in for three or four years and then leave and another student will come and, and those two people will, will have the same job. Um, uh, but there are downsides to this system as well, and and I think they're they're relatively clear, and they're they're emerging in a much stronger public discourse at the moment. Um, we have reports of you know migrant exploitation almost every week in the press, and I think compared to say 10, 12, 15 years ago, it's it's a much more frequent phenomena, and I think that is you know, correlated with. Um, the the growing number of people on these visas who who sort of lack uh, the the skills and they lack the opportunity in the labour market um, to 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 sort of fix that problem themselves um, and but but yeah it, it strikes me that this this reliance on these workers is not going away so I think of this as Australia sort of trying to have it both ways uh, and and we do have these highway jobs where we have very successful migrant outcomes in the labor market um, but we're sort of supplementing it at the same time uh, where we also have the, these other channels uh, where where we see this um, so um, I think that for like in relation to sort of what I read in the UK and and how I read those debates about low low wage sort of below those salary thresholds which are now established in in Britain's uh, migration system, uh, to us those debates we don't we don't we don't really have those debates because we don't worry too much about wages. But in our report, we recommend that this sort of system of classifying by education is is kind of outdated. Um, we had in the 1990s, about one in 10 Australians had a bachelor degree or higher, and now it's sort of 35, 40% of the labour market. And so at one stage, it was appealing, I think, to use education as a, as a framework for saying that's a good thing to have. Not many Australians have it. Let's get more people with education. Let's match that up to a skilled visa framework. But today, we think there's a really strong case to switching away from occupations and educations as proxies for skill and relying much more heavily on wage. Uh, and if you're going to do a skilled migration as your policy framework, um, putting aside whether that is the right or the wrong thing to do, uh, then if you are going to do that, then you know, wages seem like a much more um, straightforward uh, and administratively uh, to capture the gains better from migration uh, as a way to do it. Instead of trying to occupy, uh, identify occupations, um, we've got a couple of examples in our report where we look at something like a chef and a cook and in Australia, you know, this distinction matters because of how heavily prescriptive we are with our rules uh, in terms of these occupation lists. And if you are a chef with the, the, the relevant qualification or the relevant experience versus whether you are a cook, it, that makes a really big difference in our migration rules. At the moment, if you're in Sydney and you are a cook, you are on a second tier list and you access to a two year work visa, which is once renewable in Australia before you have to leave the country. If you're a chef, you get a four year work visa with a pathway to permanent residency. Now, our Department of, of, of Home Affairs, it's called, which has the immigration functions in it, you know, the onus is on them to determine an employer putting in a sponsorship and saying, this person's a chef. Oh no, this person's a cook. You know someone's cooking food in the kitchen and they're serving it in a, in a hospitality venue, it's, it's actually quite hard to distinguish when you're outside that firm. And it's quite straightforward for the firm, I think, to, to show that that person uh, can be the most beneficial occupation of whatever they can. But it's much harder to fudge their wage. Um, you know, you, you are paid 22,000 uh, pounds or 28,000 pounds, you know, that, that is your wage. Uh, and we're getting to the stage now in Australia, at least, where our data linkages with the tax office uh, are, are relatively good uh, and that sort of mistreating people and sort of fudging their salaries is becoming harder and harder to do. But it's still, it's still 
quite straightforward, I think, to, to fudge or, or, or mislead what someone's occupation is, uh, especially once they're in the country. So we recommend instead of the government trying to prescribe uh, what occupation should be eligible uh, and the processes which go along with that, uh, to set a, a wage threshold above which any occupation is, is appropriate uh, and sort of allowing firms in, in the labour market to to determine if they need a migrant above that wage now if you're below that wage uh, we were talking about permanent skilled visas and, and we see um, there being uh, a wage level if you're going to run a skilled program below which um, you can make the argument that those those workers are are semi-skilled or low skilled now i think COVID has really thrown into sort of quite stark contrast, essential work versus skilled work. And I know some of those uh, debates are ongoing, uh, especially in sort of the care sector uh, and logistics and, and a sort of essential services. Um, but for our purposes, uh, we think that this would be a, a sort of a step forward for Australia um, because it's, it's simply... Uh, we're simply stuck in a different time period where we're trying to use occupations uh, in a way which which we don't think fits uh, at the moment. So, um, Madeline, I might um, I might uh, I can either move on to shortages or I can I can sort of answer a question or, or two from you if you if you have any comments or reflections on that. I'm, I'm happy to happy to do either. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested to know what you um, have to say about shortages. I just wanted to follow up on one thing yeah. about um, yeah. the, uh, you talked about this kind of non-work routes that were being used a lot for, for low-wage jobs. And I wonder if yeah. you could say a little bit more about, um, about the backpackers, because in, yeah. so we have a, an ongoing debate in the UK at the moment about um, the youth mobility scheme, which um, brings in a lot of well, mostly Australians um, currently, but there's been, uh, the government has said that in principle, they'd like to extend it to, um, to EU countries um, and yep. that it will negotiate agreements with them. And so there's, there's a debate about the extent to which people coming on those kinds of visas um, will be a useful source of, um, of workers for employers in, um, in low wage industries. Um, mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, I, the Australian experience is sort of interesting because it's not just a straightforward, you know, there's been this incentive to work in, in horticulture. And I was wondering yep. if you could talk a little bit about that and what the, you know, how the policy works and what the, what the impacts have, have been um, of, of the way that the, that visa is designed in, in Australia. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I think it's, a, it's, it's an interesting topic because it's, you know, I don't think it's um, immediately uh, on, on face value, it looks a bit strange. Like we have, we have a, a large in normal times. Not right now. We have about forty thousand backpacks in Australia at the moment. But before the pandemic, uh, we had anywhere between one hundred and forty to two hundred thousand, depending on the time of year. Um, and so that's a, it's about one percent of our population. Um, and it was growing, you know, right, right, especially after the the global financial crisis, because Australia did relatively well. Uh, with uh, we had low unemployment rates compared to many other high income countries. We saw a lot of young people come for a year or two years to Australia in sort of 2011, 12, 13, 14. And, and those programs really grew. Um, but you, you're right, we have, we, for a long time, uh, backpackers, the idea was cultural exchange. You know, the, I, the, the policy goal was allowing Australians to go overseas in a reciprocal arrangement with another country. Uh, and over the years from 1975, where we started that with Ireland, England and Canada, I believe it was, we're now up to about 44 countries where we have these bilateral agreements. And, you know, small numbers add up and we have a couple of countries who send large numbers the uk germany france taiwan ireland sweden uh but but we have a host of other countries where sort of they have capped agreements but uh you know sort of three thousand here five thousand here eight thousand here and you know when you start totaling all these up you add up to a relatively large population and the government in 2005 said you know we we give a 12 month backpacker visa and they said if you go out and pick fruit in regional areas um, where we're finding it hard to get people to pick fruit 
uh, because you know, unsurprisingly, people don't want to pick fruit for minimum wage. It's really hard work. Uh, and and if, if the wages are sort of not increasing, you'll see large vacancies. Um, I'm very skeptical of that sort of line of argument being a shortage. I, I think that there's a lot more to it than just a vacancy rate. Um, but the government said, um, you know, if you go and pick fruit, you'll get a second year of your visa. And this proved wildly popular with backpackers who were able to get another year in Australia by going to pick fruit for three months. Uh, and at the peak in 2014, 15, 16, we had about 45, 50,000 backpackers picking and packing fruit in Australia at some stage of the, the harvest season. And best estimates suggest that that's over 50% of the workforce at any one time. So it was, as a policy goal, it was incredibly successful to use backpackers. But the problem is the tool was providing a non-monetary incentive to go and work. And when you provide a non-monetary incentive, I think you sort of scramble traditional labour market signals. If the worker's not there to earn money uh, and the employer can get away with, you know, paying as little as possible, you, we saw, we, we see basically in massive endemic exploitation where, where, where producers are trying to lower their costs as quickly as they can for benefits in the supply chain and becoming more competitive in a very tight supply chain for Australian domestic uh, supermarkets. Um, uh, while while the, the, the people who are picking the fruit are sort of, you know, they care a little bit about it, they get paid, but they're not too fussed if it's $20 an hour or $15 an hour or whatever the minimum rate is. And it, it's, it's kind of upended the entire labour market for horticulture in Australia. It's, it's made it a, 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 a sort of very well-known uh, job now where you will be treated poorly, uh, you will not be paid correctly, uh, and you will have to work your guts out um, because it's, it's a really, really difficult spot to be because before the pandemic, there was endless backpackers. Um, and so I think that as with all of these things, like there's, there's winners in that situation. There's producers who are, who are clearly winning. Uh, consumers win from you know, lower fruit prices and lower vegetable prices. So there's a whole bunch of, of sort of people who win in that situation through this public policy decision. But then you have, you know, the people who are already in those jobs, it gets a lot harder for them. Uh, and the migrants themselves face, you know, sort of very, very precarious working conditions. Um, so I think that um, these, we, we tend to gloss over a little bit of this stuff, uh, I think, but in Australia, that's a, that's a case study, I think, that was, were, is worth very close attention uh, because I think looking back, um, it has met its goal to, to increase labour supply, um, but it's come with a very large cost to do so. Interesting, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to open up um, in a moment. And so please start um, gathering your questions. Feel free to post them um, in the chat um, or raise your hand. I just want to uh, come back while people are um, thinking what they would like to ask. Um, I want to come back on this issue of, of labour shortages that you um, that you mentioned. I mean, has Australia struggled with um, with shortages? Um, how you know how does the government deal with those concerns? Yeah. So I mean. Australian governments, uh, when it comes to immigration, are, are kind of obsessed with the idea of shortage. Our, our main work visa is called the temporary skill shortage visa. So the entire premise of the visa, which we're writing our next report on this visa, is around the idea of there being skill shortages. Um, so the main way we administer this is through these occupation lists, where we say if you're on the list, uh, you know, this occupation is essentially in shortage, either in a sort of short term shortage or a more structural longer term shortage. Um, and, and these occupations are sort of, as I mentioned before, they're very specific. So as an example, we have 14 different kinds of nurses. Uh, so, you know, there's all sorts of different nurses. Uh, and 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 this, this level of detail, uh, I think, belies uh, my, I am at least inherently sceptical of, of this sort of approach because immediately I think the owner should be on like, what is a skill shortage? And 
there simply is no consensus to that question, at least in Australia. I, I've had a look elsewhere as well, and, and it seems that it's a very common term, but you sort of start picking away on the surface and it's, it sort of falls apart, I think. And it, it depends on the time frame. It depends on whether wages are, are the prevailing wages at the time or whether people sh firms should increase their wages. Um, and it depends on how the labour market changes over time as well. And, and you can have many vacancies, but a firm can deliberately keep their vacancies high. Uh, in, a, in an effort to, to curtail uh, wage costs. Uh, and I think that's fundamentally different to what a shortage is. Uh, but we just don't have any sense in Australia of sort of an agreed set of terms. Um, and, and so, uh, but at the same time, uh, we, have, uh, we, we have a very sort of scientific veneer to, to our to our. To what is shortage is and and you know that we're, we're sort of told that there's lots of data analysis and there's lots of labor market analysis going on here but when you look at the data and when you look at the analysis it's it's aggregate level it's it doesn't it doesn't disaggregate by region very well it doesn't disaggregate by sub industries very well it doesn't disaggregate by 14 different types of nurses you know so it's very, very difficult to sort of be extraordinarily precise with an occupational classification and say this occupation is skilled and in shortage and this occupation is not. When we're looking at, you know, unemployment rates and vacancy rates uh, for, you know, levels of, of sort of populations of 100,000, 200,000, 1 million, 5 million in Melbourne, you know, 7 million in Sydney, it's, it's, it's just, uh, I think we are, we are sort of tricking ourselves into thinking this is this is extraordinarily specific and scientific, um, but at the end of the day, it's about firm demand, uh, labour demand, uh, and where that demand is, and then how you match that up with it with a given supply of workers or potential workers. And immigration clearly changes the mix; it expands the potential uh, for for firms to recruit uh, outside of 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 that sort of fixed number of existing people in the labour market. Um, but but we sort of say a shortage a lot, but we don't have any any sort of oomph uh, behind it. And I I really think of it as a way for governments to sort of micromanage that as a response to, to sort of firm level demand. And clearly, I don't think immigration policymakers anywhere in high income countries want to let employers have whatever they want. I think that would be a, a terrible idea. But I think this idea of a shortage as the sort of solving the primary goal of an economic based immigration system is also sort of significantly misplaced with a broader goal of how does immigration affect your country? How does immigration affect well-being? How does immigration affect, uh, you know, wages for all workers, as opposed to saying, you know, how does the, the importation of people who have nurse qualifications affect existing nurses in Australia? Like, that's a very narrow question. And I think for policymakers to get stuck up on those types of questions uh, really belies the sense of what immigration does and the effects that it has. Um, and, and that's a, it's, it's, it's sort of a real shame because we get stuck on these sort of very small, specific, narrow questions when really we should be taking a much broader analysis uh, of these public policy implications. Um, and, and that doesn't happen when you start, when your starting point is skill shortages. Uh, and, and that's a point we tried to make in our report. And that's a point we're going to be sort of doubling down on for our, for our temporary skill shortage report um, because you know, we just we think that it's it's sort of misguided and misplaced, and, and perhaps it was once valid at a certain time, uh, but today uh, we think that it's 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 it doesn't have a place. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's very interesting, and something that we see here as well. I think politically, the idea of um, being able to fill shortages um, is very appealing, and it, it sounds like a, a wonderfully rational, scientific thing to do. But the implementation is a little bit more. Um, more difficult. 